Hi, I'm Dan Coffin, owner of SPNC and certified professional agronomist. And I want to talk to you briefly for a few minutes about foliar feeding alfalfa and an alfalfa grass mixture. That's been one of the biggest interesting things of my career has been watching people actually grow alfalfa on far, far less dry P and K inputs and produce a higher value crop and more tonnage on less fertilizer. And most people would scratch their heads and say, no, that's not possible. But then we realize that alfalfa is an entirely different crop than most of the other row crops that we grow. It has a big taproot. It sends the taproot deep into the soil. Roots have been found as, as high, uh, as low as 28 to 40 feet below the surface, especially in gravelly soils where alfalfa does amazingly well. And we're often thinking, oh, that's the worst place to put it. But actually, because it can get down deep, it can find all kinds of mineral nutrition. Now, how in the world could an alfalfa foliar program work to, to be the equivalent of all those total nutrients? Well, the secret is in the fact that when we foliar feed alfalfa, we put orthophosphate, the available form of phosphate, not, not the poly that we think of a lot of, of, of in um, uh, 10340, a greatest percentage, like 70 or 80% of that is poly, the unavailable form. Uh, and even in, with uh, uh, the orthophosphate that's in dry fertilizer, oftentimes it's just overcompensation. It's, it's way too much. So if we actually have alfalfa growing and we spray it with orthophosphate, some micronutrients, some chelated micronutrients that will not react with the phosphate in that solution. Um, if we put some thiosol, ammonium thiosulfate for the sulfur, uh, if we blend in a little bit of boron, which is incredibly important in a plant to be able to make the sugars move back and forth from the roots to the top, then what we understand, and, and even soil biology to help release phosphate from the soil, because literally there are thousands of pounds of phosphate in minerals in soil, as well as anything that we've put in there through the years that's bound up chemically that's that's been tied up and won't release. Biology is what causes that release. 90% of the phosphate that gets into your plant based on the university uh, discussion uh, throughout microbiology tells you 90% of it has passed through biology to get into your plant. So biology is extremely important. But when we actually put these products on, then what we do is we raise the natural sugar levels inside that plant because that's what orthophosphate does is provide a chemical energy <clears throat> to allow the physical energy in that plant as sugars to be formed. So the extra sugar will help grow the tops and any extra extra above and beyond is going back down into the taproot and causing the roots to form and move deeper. Once we actually go back and cut that alfalfa again, when you cut it, it's no different than trimming the hedge around your house. When you trim the outside edges of the hedge, the hedge doesn't get bigger, it gets thicker. And the more we cut that alfalfa, every time we cut it, those hormones change and it actually stimulates the plant to make more buds. If the buds are on the taproot and they are at or below an inch, they will form a root. You'll see a bud come out there and a root will grow. If it's up near the top of that, in the top half inch or three quarters of an inch, uh, the buds that are there will turn into stems. And so more stems come each time we cut the alfalfa. Now, once that stem grows up to a point for about seven to 10 days, it puts on five or six leaves, that plant can that point any time forward from that point can be foliar fed again. And the whole process starts over. And so what happens is we end up taking care of all of the individual plants when we come to foliar feeding. Now, the other thing that's important about that is because of the nature of the products that we use with the chelated micronutrients and the orthophosphates, we end up getting more total digestible nutrients. We get more micronutrients. We get more enzymes formed. We get more proteins formed. The protein content stays way up. And in many cases, the protein content changes into forms that the animal would more readily use and utilize itself. So the other thing that we can accomplish is typically if we're balancing the soil is when the alfalfa is grown, um, the balance of the nutrition allows for more calcium and magnesium and less potassium in there. The agronomist fight that's been out here for years with alfalfa is you're never gonna get that tonnage if we don't put more and more potash out there because more and more potash actually flows more water into that plant and when the plant grows up lots of leaves full of water, it does weigh heavier for a period of time, but once the water evaporates, it's gone. So what we do is we fill it up with sugars and the plants um, are, are very heavy and they stay heavy. 
and they stay uh, the the um, the stems will stay filled up when you harvest. So you're harvesting higher quality feed all the time. The irony is that 185 relative feed value hay grown like on a system like this will outperform 225 or higher relative feed value hay that's grown in a different system. And so you actually can get a premium for a lesser RFB because the animals do better, the animals live longer, their rate of gain or their milk output will increase. And the nutritionist will finally tell you, oh, finally, because there's not so much potash in this tissue, I can balance your animals for calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. We have far less fevers. We have less mastitis problems. We have all kinds of things that are better. And so as people have developed the system to be able to do this and, and, and encourage it, and in a dry year, because the roots go deeper, Normally, people at least get an extra ton. They tell me time and time again, we've gotten at least one extra ton in a dry season that no one else is getting. And that's because the plants aren't just harvesting moisture from the top where most of the roots are. They're harvesting it way down deep in, in the profile. So foliar alfalfa, foliar on alfalfa is important. The other thing that happens is when you're putting lots and lots of nitrogen in an a alfalfa grass mixture, if you put too much nitrogen out there, that favors the grass. And when you favor the grass, the grass grows up and it chokes the alfalfa. Common sense. If you're using almost 100% foliars with little or no nitrogen in it, and you foliar feed the alfalfa grass mix, you favor the alfalfa because the grass needs nitrogen and it's going to get it right up near the surface. So with very little nitrogen, your alfalfa will smother your grass. When you utilize this system, either with a little dry ammonium sulfate, small quantities, or ammonium thiosulfate that has nitrogen and sulfur in it, and you spray it frequently or start the season before the alfalfa grows with a little lamb thio or some ammonium sulfate, the best of both worlds occurs. And you get a very, very nice longevity out of both the alfalfa and the grass. And so there's really no secrets. It's just a matter of actually understanding how the crop is growing and how to treat it and how to favor it so that both pieces of the puzzle, um, the grass and the alfalfa get their needs met. And then you end up with a much, much more longer stand that's valuable to you. If you have other questions about alfalfa grass mixtures or our programs for them, please get a hold of us at, uh, at SPNC Corp. Uh, the number here is area code 260-478-8080. Or you can always get us at spncorp2cs.com.